it, it's a little difficult to explain local first because it's almost like an overloaded idea. There's a lot of things that have uh, been like piled on to what local first architecture means. Uh, so the core of the idea, at least in my head, is that the source of truth or a, a local in a local first application, the data primarily lives on the device, on the device of, that the user is using. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't live in the server. Uh, uh, all that means is that the source of truth or the authoritative source of that data is on the user's device and whatever, and the user is free to interact with it, do whatever with it. Um, the user can keep the data even after uninstalling your application or if, or if it gets removed for any reason, the data is still there. Dev Agrawal discusses the newfound interest in local first application development, what benefits it offers, and the importance of data ownership. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Modern Web Podcast. I am your host, Rob Osell. I'm an architect at This.Labs. Today, we're excited to sit down and talk with Dev Agrawal. He is a software engineer at Smart Data, and uh, you may have seen him on Twitch, may see him on Twitter or at a conference. I'm not sure. Dev, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yes, you can definitely see me a lot on Twitter, and uh, I, I do go to a lot of conferences, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, uh, to get us, us started, um, would you mind kind of introducing yourself a little bit more than what I just did there? Kind of, sure. you know, what, you know, what kind of things are interest you kind of how you arrive at this place and, uh, and you know, what you think we might be talking about today? Of course. So I have been writing full stack JavaScript applications for about seven years now, uh, started learning in about 2016, 17. My first freelance project was in 2018, um, where I built like a kind of a, health, a care, a job provider almost, where you can go and apply and look for jobs, have a profile, and then companies can like advertise for jobs. Um, but it was more focused around like healthcare. Um, since then, I've been just uh, here and there building volunteer, volunteer side projects, uh, full time and part time jobs, and. Uh, a little about two years ago, I started making YouTube videos. Um, and then I started getting into more like modern kind of cloud dev tools. Um, and kind of the combination of both of them ended up, uh, ended me up in DevRel. So I was a DevRel at Clerk for about nine months. And now I'm back in full-time software engineering land at Smart Data. That's awesome. Um yeah, I mean, coming up from the golden ages of of JavaScript, Node, React, mm -hmm. and kind of all the implications, the the, the mean and the, the Mern stacks. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. Right, exactly. Um, it, it's so fascinating, right? Because like that was really a period of sort of loosely constrained mm -hmm. JavaScript growth and incursions. I mean, that's mm -hmm. also the era of um, Electron apps. Mm -hmm. And the belief that uh, you could deploy JavaScript to mobile apps, desktop apps, web apps, embedded apps, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe things are starting to change now, mm -hmm. but that certainly was a, you know, a fun era to be developing in. That's for sure. Yeah. It was the Cambrian explosion of JavaScript <laughs> software. Well, some of the things that we're going to talk about today are things like uh, some of the passions of yours recently, things like local sure. first development, which is a really exciting um, thing, you know, I feel like local first development is a little bit like islands architecture, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, these kinds of ideas that mm -hmm. maybe, uh, don't have all of the fanfare in the world, but they are like mm -hmm. building these really, uh, committed groups of mm -hmm. engineers who are like, I don't care what you think of it. I don't care if it, yeah. if it maths out the right way. It's just good. It just mm -hmm. works. Uh, so we'll talk about that and the excitingness of that. We'll talk about uh, server components and some of the developments of the meta frameworks. But I did kind of want to briefly start out with this idea mm -hmm. that as somebody like yourself who is online, who is still out there braving away at, on, on the front lines of Twitter and, and you know, <laughs> YouTube and content creation, um, you know, you come across a lot of takes. Um, and especially with things like local first or server mm -hmm. components or serverless or even just JavaScript in general and web development, mm -hmm. people have hot takes. And mm -hmm. so I was kind of curious your perception 
um, on the state of the discourse. Do you think it's mm-hmm. shifted? Do you think it's different now, better, worse than it's ever been? Do you think mm-hmm. that it's more disingenuous than not? Like, is there still good conversations happening out there? Like, what is the state of online mm-hmm. discourse in your mind and, and the way that you see it? Uh, horrible. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll start off by uh, kind of uh, maybe explaining how I how I kind of like navigate around these uh these like really hostile environments. Uh, so whenever I hear a take or s- someone expresses an opinion about some piece of technology, um, I I try to be not influenced by the opinion itself, first of all. Um, and the sec- that's the first thing that I try to do. Sometimes if it's like from a person who I really respect, who uh, kind of maybe has a track record of uh, saying a lot of things that can- turned out to be right, or like having a lot of good uh, engineering experience and uh, opinions. Uh, and then maybe I get influenced by that take. But a lot of times I try to look at uh, why a person is saying something. Like if, if they have an opinion, why do they have it? Uh, people don't just develop opin- opinions out of thin air. It's usually informed a lot by not just what their experience has been, but also how much they have learned about this tech piece of technology that they're talking about. So, uh, which kind of means that someone who has, let's say, a, a long history of building Java applications, if they just came across React and talked about it, I I would kind of consider their opinion as like someone who's done a lot of like serious development, but uh, maybe they don't know too much about React yet. Maybe they, uh, they've they barely uh, gotten to use it or not really like heard uh, what what are the ideas that make it great? So that's the kind of, uh, that's my mentality when I, I kind of navigate through these. Uh, so kind of by that measure, there's always good discussions happening. Um, good discussions are the very first thing, one of the very first things that happen with new technology. Um, and the trolls kind of come in later uh, to spoil the fun. But there's always good discussion if you go looking for it. It's on Twitter, it's on Reddit. It's one of the big reasons why I'm still on Twitter, uh, and I try to sift through the uh, all the pile of uh, crap that's on Twitter, and try to get to those really meaningful, technical, and experienced discussions. Uh, so yes, th- those are always there. And as long as you kind of try to isolate the opinion from the person and maybe figure out why that opinion has been developed in the first place, that's going to be a lot more useful. Uh, whenever you're you're thinking about these takes, it's really interesting too, right? Because I, I agree with you a lot. I I, I I try not to respond to the to the the heat or the mm-hmm. intensity or the certainty of the opinion, mm-hmm. um, because oftentimes mm-hmm. you know we it's a it's a sh- that's the game. Engagement mm-hmm. is the game. It doesn't even come across your timeline mm-hmm. if if it isn't that. But, yeah, you know, to me the difference really is 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 there is there meat behind it? Is there mm-hmm. actual thought? Or somebody just saying something to just get the mm-hmm. kick the butt beehive? Because yeah. some of the best learning I've ever had is in seeing mm-hmm. an opinion that I I vehemently disagree with. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm going to research this and I'm going to show them that it's wrong. And as I yeah. start researching, I'm like, I think they're right. <laughs> you know, it's like that yeah. can happen sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the it's the, the nugget of, of happiness mm-hmm. at the center of, you know, what can sometimes be seem mm-hmm. like a very mm-hmm. loud ecosystem. Definitely, yeah. The intensity with which someone expresses an, op- an opinion, even that could be information because, uh, like, you can use that as okay, this person really dislikes it in this piece of technology, which probably means they've had a bad experience with something similar to it, um, or they've had a great experience with something similar to it. Uh, so even that can be like used as valuable information when you're researching. Absolutely, and you know what? If you're listening to this again. It's okay to have opinions. It's okay to be wrong on the internet, but uh, mm-hmm. just remember, there's people on the other sides of those keyboards. Yes, uh, and uh, you know, I think even on Twitter, it's sometimes fun when you make those very real human com- connections with somebody, where somebody's like mm-hmm. aggressively wrong, and you politely re- correct them, and then they just accept the correction, and they're like, "Oh yeah, my bad," and you're like, "That's right." There are normal mm-hmm. interactions on the internet to be had still. So. Yeah, those are some of the best conversations I've been. I've been on a couple of like them on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Approach it with humility, even with your own with your own opinions as well. Mm-hmm. You know, what is this local first phenomenon and mm-hmm. what about it has so caught your attention? Sure. Yeah. So 
I'm going to try to give, uh, it's a little difficult to explain local first because it's almost like an overloaded idea. There's a lot of things that have uh, been like piled on to what local first architecture means. Uh, so the core of the idea, at least in my head, is that the source of truth or a local in a local first application, the data primarily lives on the device, on the device of, that the user is using. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't live in the server. Uh, uh, all that means is that the source of truth or the authoritative source of that data is on the user's device and whatever, and the user is free to interact with it, do whatever with it. Um, the user can keep the data even after uninstalling your application or if, or if it gets removed for any reason, the data is still there. Um, and we only use server resources if we want to like back that data up so that we can switch a device and we can still gain access to the same data or we want to share or collaborate with someone. So then in that case, we would start, we would need a server to establish a connection with them and then we can both collaborate on the same data. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the core idea of local first apps. Any questions? That's, it's so funny too, because like, I don't know if that's occurring to everybody as you're listening, mm -hmm. but it's a pretty profound difference. Again, you know, people are like, well, I have data on my device all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, yeah, but that's a cache. It's exactly as you said, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's who has the authoritative copy. Mm -hmm. If the server and the client disagree about mm -hmm. a particular piece of data, yeah. usually the server's correct and we update mm -hmm. our local cache from the server. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what that whole idea is like, even mm -hmm. when you have uh, these offline mode type situations, mm -hmm. usually you're saying, oh, just do things with optimistic state updates until you can get to the server, then update with, with what the definitive server copy is. But this mm -hmm. is inverted. It's the exact opposite. You always have the definitive version. The mm -hmm. server is the one that might be out of date and reporting to other people out of date information, mm -hmm. and it will catch up with you when it, mm -hmm. when it can. That's, yeah. that's pretty profound, actually. Yeah, and it's also like mechanically speaking it seems really similar to like if you have just a regular server application but you also have optimistic updates like you pointed out uh because what happens is you have some data in memory and like locally you update it you it immediately reflects on the ui so from the user's mindset is that okay this is done the fact that it's going to the server the server is acknowledging uh it and then and then the client marks it as okay this is complete that's all that's happening in the background. The user doesn't, like the user might have some awareness of it. You might show a loading spinner somewhere, but if you use something like Trello, you just move cards, you add things to it, um, and you don't really think too much about how long it's taking to go to the server and come back. So like, ar almost like architecturally speaking, they, they are very similar. The only difference is that the synchronization that's happening in the background, uh, we. Uh, in local first apps, we try to fully automate that using a sync engine, and uh, it becomes like an op optional thing. Like once you once you update the device, once you update the data that's on the device, you're pretty much done. Like this, uh, because that's the primary source of data. Uh, if the server disagrees, that means the client hasn't synced its update yet. So we flipped uh, who's who's in charge basically. Interesting. What is the significance of that with things like business logic and rules? Mm -hmm. You know, so so often people are used to building APIs where maybe they send mm -hmm. the minimum amount of necessary information. It's very mm -hmm. common on the server to be the first step is to go into the database and pull the mm -hmm. user record out that you want to yeah. operate on. Do you mm -hmm. end up having to do you still do all of that on the server? And do you have to send the data with the call? Mm -hmm. Or what you know, what is that what does that do for API design? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So that's kind of the part that I'm also in, in the process of trying to figure out uh, because often a lot of the kind of use cases for local first, they don't quite overlap great with why we, why we would use server first architectures if you're building like websites or e-commerce uh, applications or anything like that's uh, heavily business related because a lot of those things uh, are like need to happen on a secure server uh, on the server somewhere, like a lot of those things are not user specific. So there's ways you can kind of like bring a local first architecture into that zone and do more things on the server. Uh, but this is currently kind of an, uh, in, I guess an unbridged gap where I would like sure, to sure, like, sure. uh, maybe see it bridge so that we can do better things with there. There are some projects trying to get there. Um, but yes, this is like, 
at least for me, an, an, an unexplored use case of how we would use local first. Uh, but if I was to build something like that today, I would maybe try to have two different models where uh, all my all my data still goes to the server, and uh, maybe I would call it an offline first app instead of local first. There's a kind of like a slight distinction where in, a, in an offline first app, you can still cache all the data on the client um, and have mm. make it available offline even like, uh, but it's still a cache of the server data. The server is still the authoritative source. So maybe I would go for an offline first architecture there instead because the server needs to control that data. Yeah, what are the cases that you think are really well suited to this? I mean, it occurs to me that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I play a, a, a decent amount of like mobile games and mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the mobile game architectures I see are mm -hmm. this way where, you know, you can open up the the, the code or the game locally mm -hmm. and it keeps a very authoritative version of what you were doing, how long it's been since you last on and all the progress mm -hmm. that's been since there. Yeah. But if you were to open it up on another device and mm -hmm. you were out of connection, then you're getting mm -hmm. a, a dated server version yeah. of that. Um, mm -hmm. And so like that seems like a good argument, something that is primarily maybe single player, except for mm -hmm. maybe some updates that you're getting from other users. Are there other mm -hmm. cases that you think that you've seen that this is really good? Or do you think that this could be applied mm -hmm. everywhere in certain capacities? Like what what kind of cases mm -hmm. do you think are, are a good match for this? Yeah. Um, so really any kind of personal or like team base, anything where the data really belongs to the users and like it can mm. collab like it can exchange with each other where the server doesn't need to know about it so linear is like one of the best examples of an app that's kind of built this way it's a productivity uh, uh tool it ha it's basically kind of like replaces jira and uh, it's built around like it's uh, in-house sync engine where you just make updates to your data that's available locally and it automatically gets synchronized everywhere. So it's it's definitely good for single player experiences, but it's also very good for multiplayer experiences because of something called the CRDT. Uh, so CRDT is kind of like a data uh, data structure where you can only make specific kind of updates, but you can like you can replicate the same data in multiple places. So you can have so you and I we both can have let's say a representation of a specific document. You make some changes to it, I make some changes to it. And then all of, uh, both of our changes can be uh, combined together, merged together without any conflicts. So, and what a CRDT allows is that you can take that same document, you can go offline for days, keep making changes to it. And I can also keep making changes to it. But as soon as you come online, I will start seeing your changes and you will start seeing my changes. And we don't have to do any additional work around uh, how to like manage conflicts between them. So it automatically merges together seamlessly. So CRDTs enable uh, things like, uh, so if you've seen experience like Figma or Notion, I don't think that all of them use CRDTs, but you can build something like that where you have multiple people on the screen collaborating, editing the same document. Um, and then like they can join as they leave, they can, uh, they can join as they wish or leave and whatever. So it's also pretty good for multiplayer apps as well. With That's the correct so data structures. weird. You wouldn't think that. You wouldn't think that. Mm -hmm. But I guess it, it that does make sense. Um, as long as you can structure mm -hmm. your, like you said, your data and your communication in ways that they can mm -hmm. be um, sequenced again correctly to form mm -hmm. a definitive truth, uh, some mm -hmm. sort of concurrence algorithm or something like that, that that people can, yeah, can kind of reconstruct what the mm -hmm. real game state should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and things like CRDTs, uh, there, there's a lot of popular libraries for this, like Automerge and YJS. A lot of them have all of this built in. So, like, if I wanted to build like a real time Notion or MS Word, I can just pick up a, a, one of those CRDT libraries and build on top of that. So, all I need to do is to add word processing features on top of a document, and everything else is taken care of by the infrastructure. There's also a feature that I saw recently in a game I was playing that really, in, really, in intrigued me and it was that it was a game that imitated multiplayer because mm -hmm. the game loop itself was not interactive you largely it just played out so okay. um it was the case that you could be engaged in multiplayer relationships what i realized mm -hmm. is i said oh I, I i can have settings that change the animation styles of mm -hmm. what's happening on screen right. as can my opponent so we mm -hmm. would be viewing the game at different speeds there's no mm -hmm. way for this game to show us the same experience so what mm -hmm. it must be doing is sequencing the whatever random number generator for mm -hmm. each of us, and we just watch a playthrough mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. of the game at our own speed. And I was mm-hmm. like, what a profound idea that I feel so connected to somebody else. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I'm doing something that is definitively local. I mean, mm-hmm. it's entirely just running on my box. I'm just watching a replay of it. It didn't happen on the server. We're not sampling mm-hmm. the same thing, right? Um, and and there probably is some really cool applications of that pattern that we could find where you get a lot of that connection to other users, but mm-hmm. yet you're not forcing everybody to be in this synchronized, everybody right. looking at the same thing at the same time type of mm-hmm. uh, condition that we sometimes try to enforce using the server. Before we get back to our conversation, we wanted to say thank you to This.Labs, who is the sponsor of today's show. If you need help with a project that has failed to deliver on time or are in need of a team that feels true ownership over your engineering projects, definitely hit up This.Labs. They specialize in helping business leaders ensure their strategic digital initiatives stay on track. Trusted by companies like PlayStation, Capital One, Herman Miller, PayPal, and T-Mobile, you can find them at This.Co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Now let's return to our show. Definitely, yeah, yeah. It, uh, the, I think the local, the idea of local first is certainly not new. Uh, I was uh, a few months ago. I was chatting with one of my uncles, who's much much older than me, but he he got into software development like way back. He still does, uh, like .NET, and he's on like .NET framework, not even the new .NET. So he has been like a super uh, old school Microsoft .NET developer for like many like multiple decades at this point i was talking to him about like his approach to building stuff and he was explaining to me that hey okay so when you're building something you can either do a local database or you can do a remote database if you do a local database it's very quick all the the app performance is really fast but if you do a remote database uh like you can have things like backups but you have you have you also have an additional latency um and like it was everything about that local first people keep talking about that now like uh, a software developer from 20 years ago is telling me this is how they used to build stuff but the the missing part is that they didn't have a synchronization mechanism so that they can always do local first and then it automatically uh, get backed up now there there were some techniques i believe that's like maybe they're in, built into uh, like the sql server database or whatever databases they were using which could automatically replicate and uh, um like back up all the data but it definitely did not have any synchronization capabilities uh of like multiplayer collaborative things so yeah it's very interesting to hear uh that that local first is really not a new idea it's all the old ideas that have now become a lot more useful because of a certain new like innovation in technology which in this Mm. case is the sync engine that's really cool. Yeah, that's such a powerful tool to have to enable mm-hmm. these kind of patterns. One of the things that strikes me is that when you were saying kind of like local first sort of says that the users own the data, um, mm-hmm. you know, we've heard that phrase recently as well, generally in the mm-hmm. decentralized world and Web3 mm-hmm. and pieces like that. So, but it would occur to me as I was thinking about it, and I'm curious if I have this, if I have this right, mm-hmm. even though they, the Web3 talks about decentralization, Mm -hmm. That's not really who owns the data per se. Mm -hmm. That's who owns the storage of that data in some sense. Like Mm -hmm. that's still not local first, right? Because the ledger or whatever that's that's Mm -hmm. hosting it is still the thing that's definitive. Mm -hmm. Um, Your local copy would be considered a clone or an an, you know an an optimistic advancement Mm -hmm. of that of that record. So. Um, I guess, could you draw a delineation in your mind between Mm -hmm. to the extent to which you understand it of like what decentralized decentralization Mm -hmm. means relative to local first? Yeah, maybe. Uh, So I don't know much about Web3, I'll be honest. Uh, I've tried to like listen through a lot of like blockchain explanations and I still don't fully get it. Uh, But I think one of the disagreement or not disagreement, but distinction points between something like blockchain and something like local first especially with something like CRDTs, would be that CRDT always try to merge everything together. So regardless of what changes you make, what changes I make, both of them will be will end up in the final document. Uh, but a blockchain works on top of consensus. So blockchain, yes, uh, there's always like one source of truth and we just have replicas of it. So if you make some changes and I make some changes, uh, not all of them might end up in the final ledger because it has to establish on some sort of some sort of 
consensus on what actually happened in uh, what order it happened in and then every other, everything else will be rejected so that's uh, that's really the only thing that i know about uh, i could even be wrong on that just because i don't understand blockchain enough uh, but yes that yes uh, yes so what you were saying that is true yes that it's a go. copy of the data and as we said at the beginning of this conversation, hey, if we're wrong mm -hmm. on the internet, that's okay. Feel free to let us know. We'll be happy to update our, our, our information and our priors. Mm -hmm. I'll ch I check the YouTube comments. Go down and <laughs> let me know. <laughs> there we go. Uh, a bit of a jump here, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, another kind of paradigm shift, if we're calling mm -hmm. Local First kind of a change in a new paradigm or a new way of mm -hmm. thinking of developing applications sort of challenges some of the notions that we had mm -hmm. certainly in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, Server components in the meta framework developments mm -hmm. certainly is that as well. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot has been said about these positively, mm -hmm. negatively, and otherwise, some people just trying to understand things. But what what has so enticed you about this as an opportunity sure, yeah. or something that you think makes you excited about web development kind of moving forward? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I mentioned earlier that I've spent about seven years writing full stack JavaScript applications. And uh, which also means that I've spent seven years experiencing the pain of ha keeping the front end and the back end or the client and the server like so far apart from each other. Even though we're using the same programming language on both, we treat them as like two very different things, uh, two things that can only talk to each other with a strict interface um, that we also have to like completely document and make public maybe even. Uh, so that's those are the things that I've spent a lot of time on. And when I see server components, and before server components, when I saw TRPC, I guess, um, mm -hmm. I, I saw these as solutions of like breaking that gap and kind of going back to, you're, you're just building one app and you can, you can break it apart as you want. You don't have, like our tools don't, the tools don't tell me how to break apart my app. That's a decision that I can make uh, as I want. And the tools just give me like one unified kind of experience to build whatever I want. So I see server components as kind of like one of the final form of, est of establishing this uh, kind of experience for developers. And it, it is one of these things that as you hear about it and you hear kind of the pitch for it, like what its mm -hmm. promise is mm -hmm. and when it's working well, I think it's one of these things that you're just like, yes, this sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but the experience that I've had and, and been on teams and seen them have is that mm -hmm. it is it is a surprisingly deep departure from mm -hmm. the world of spas that we've been in, single page applications yeah. that we've been in for several years. And mm -hmm. I've watched teams sit there and spend hours trying to figure out how something that they could have done in no time at all in a single page mm -hmm. application, trying to reconceptualize what the mm -hmm. data flow and the model is on what should happen on the server, what should happen on the client? What's the right mm -hmm. caching strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. How has that experience been for, for you as well and, mm -hmm. and the conversations that you've had with people? Because like, mm -hmm. I feel like it's a necessary, I don't want to call it an evil, but it's a necessary mm -hmm. struggle, I think, that we need to go through for a promising yeah. paradigm. But like, have mm -hmm. you also been experiencing these kind of pain points as, as you're learning these as well? Yeah, definitely. When I first heard about the announce, announcement of server components, I was not a big fan. And it took me about it took me like a few solid months to uh no pun intended to kind of like uh let it sink in maybe build something with it try to understand what it's doing to get to a point where like okay this is definitely that paradigm shift that maybe i didn't even know that i wanted uh that's kind of how it made me feel um about the yeah it's it certainly is a big departure from uh like how we are doing things today so i talked about like or like the pain of trying to build two apps that have to work together, that as a, something on a server, something on the client. And I think because that has like pretty much always existed, we have never been able to like fully cover it. We have tried to build solutions on top of solutions and structures and libraries uh, to make this like less of a problem or something that's uh, more seamless to work with. So it took something like TRPC to bridge that gap over TypeScript, like provide a fully type safe layer for it. Uh, but you can, but it's still kind of informed how you were breaking apart your code to a good extent. Um, so I think when something like server component showed up, 
sh- shows up that takes things way back and then changes some paradigms instead of like sticking to the ways that we've already been doing stuff it's a big change from it, it's a big change it's almost like you you're going on this trajectory but then mm-hmm. something went back here and started on another another trajectory we now have to cross this gap to get there yeah uh where are some people who are that, that's why like we always talk about unlearning stuff because to unlearn you have to come <laughs> back here and then maybe this jump will be easier yeah and i wonder like sometimes you know it, it, this is almost like where when you learn a new language one of the big mm-hmm. pain points you have when you're learning the new language is that mm-hmm. you have well okay this both works for programming languages and spoken languages or written mm-hmm. languages is that you have to go through that really painful point period mm-hmm. when you think in the old paradigm but mm-hmm. write in the new paradigm or like mm-hmm. you think in your old language and you translate yeah. it into the new language and you're like that's mm-hmm. not how we speak in this language and then you it finally yeah. clicks and i think the whole community just is not quite sure what to do with themselves because it seemed mm-hmm. like this was being sold as just like a an addition a value add mm-hmm. just a, a, a sheer addition over what we were doing but mm-hmm. it really isn't. It is a pretty, it doesn't seem like it would be, but it's a pretty mm-hmm. fundamental paradigm shift. It feels like mm-hmm. the way we're developing apps. And, you know, you've been around since 2017. I mean, you kind of remember what like the earlier days of React were when, mm-hmm. you know, React used to be considered arcane and completely mm-hmm. ununderstandable and counterintuitive. And mm-hmm. people used to say, how could this possibly be the future? This makes mm-hmm. no sense at all. And now that's like maybe the most common default way that people think about web development. So, yeah you know, we will get there eventually mm-hmm. with this, I suppose. Yeah. And I do think that uh, the ideas uh, that led to server components are a lot of the same ideas that led to React in the first place, uh, which is prob- which is why I also have a lot of confidence in it because like, okay, this is, a, this is basically what they tried to do and it worked great. And they're just trying to do it again, but uh, in a different, like on a different part of the stack. Um, and I'll also say that, uh, server components as an idea as like a thing that we can possibly do is the thing that i'm very excited about i am not the biggest fan of nextjs or uh, like most meta frameworks implementations of it uh, hmm. i think i think nextjs has its own uh, its own set of problems but uh, there's uh, server components are something that a framework needs to implement and when a framework is implementing them they'll add a lot of their own opinions on top of it correct and uh, Next.js has way too many opinions, which kind of for me uh, takes away from the fun or like adds too many barriers to like fully experiencing what's the server components and being like flexible with them. So a lot of things around like caching strategies or um, like h- hitting a kind of an old cache when you know things have been updated, pretty much everything around caching that's Next.js specific. So I try to isolate that from uh, like server components as a paradigm. And I think Vaku, the Vaku.gg uh, frame, a React framework that was built by Daishi, who's also built like uh, Zustand and Valshio and another one, Jotai. Yeah. So he built a React framework, which doesn't have most of those. It's a very minimal framework on top of like uh, server components. And it doesn't have a lot of like it does if for a long time. It didn't even have a router, but uh, now they've added like a file system based router, a very simple one that you can use. So. I think uh, for someone who's new to server components, who's trying to explore the paradigm, Vaku might be a great choice to like get a feel of what the uh, what the underlying model is, and maybe then move on to something more, uh, something like Next.js with a lot more opinions and uh, tools baked in. Interesting. I, I I like that too because I think maybe even more so than other um, frameworks. Yeah, these these meta frameworks are more different than they seem, even if they mm-hmm. are doing things in a similar way. You get this a little bit with Signals too, where everybody's brand mm-hmm. of Signals is just a little bit different, even though yeah. they're all built around the kind of the same API in general. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, for me, Remix has been the version of this that's just mm-hmm. worked in my brain. I don't mm-hmm. know why it just it just sits nicer in my brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, is other than the one that you just named, are there any that are particularly? Is, is it Solid Start? Is it Felt Kit? Is it Mm-hmm. party town whatever uh you know what is are there any of them mm-hmm. that are, are hitting for you or is it more mm-hmm. just the pattern's good and you're waiting for the right implementation of it to show up yeah i mean honestly i'm i i always i kind of pendulum back and forth between uh react and solid all the time yeah, like especially in terms of like what should i be using for my side projects 
because um, I really like server components. I really like what they're trying to do. But again, it, I still don't think it's like the final form. Like, okay, I've, I mentioned that before. It's kind of like final form. But I still think there might be some uh, some tweaks around maybe the framework that's around it or how we implement, uh, how we work around some of its limitations. Um, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I forgot what the question was. So any okay, particular one frameworks. that that you like is yeah. it, is it Solid Start or or Yeah. So I very much like Solid Start definitely. Um I am very excited about what Solid JS is doing. I know it's been around for a while but in the last like 2 years or so it has come it has almost fully infected the JavaScript web development landscape. Everyone has signals now every or and the ones that don't have a signal want signals. And the two frameworks just rewrote themselves to look like solid. So its infection in the web dev community has been like very interesting to see. And uh, but again, it's the ideas that led to that. Uh, I watch I watch like five hour long grind Carniado streams. So maybe whatever I say might be like I know uh, you like you'll probably have to watch his five hour streams for a long time to uh, like kind of maybe figure it out or. Uh, but the point is that he has an approach of like building primitives and trying to do the most efficient thing possible. And uh, his take on bridging that gap between the client and server, uh, it has also been very interesting to see, which is which is which was kind of the core problem well, that server components are solving for me. Absolutely, yeah, we're big Ryan Carney out of fans here, and uh, mm -hmm. his his Friday streams are should be required viewing for for web developers. <laughs> that is an, an incredibly dense amount of knowledge bombs being dropped almost weekly sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely something to check out. Yeah, I, you know, again, it, as we're getting closer to the end here, mm -hmm. what I like about the server components piece, besides the fact that a lot of these meta frameworks, mm -hmm. let's just say the average per, the experience of these meta frameworks is pushing us to be a little bit more embracing of the web platform in general, and a, mm -hmm. more of a reliance on um, you know, core web technologies, which is, I think, a good direction for us to be heading as an industry. But mm -hmm. in general, I think the, the the promise of it for me that really kind of sold me is how many times have you been working as a full stack developer and you're building a front end and then mm -hmm. you're building a back end and mm -hmm. engineering practices would dictate that you're building a peer front end, which is mm -hmm. a consumer of a peer API, an API mm -hmm. that you could develop any number of different apps that would all consume it. But in mm -hmm. reality, no, it's an mm -hmm. exact it's API that's being used to drive a very specific app. And mm -hmm. I like the idea that um, meta frameworks and server components are finally sort of saying, give up the game. <laughs> mm -hmm. You do need to run things on the server. That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But let's stop pretending like you're going to do it through some pure REST API. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're going to try to hide all your verbs. That was for me what a lot of the TRPC mm -hmm. stuff was about is like, yeah, you REST people can guess or try to make this sound like it's all documents at the end of the day but you know mm -hmm. we're all coding uh actions and and function calls into our rest apis mm -hmm. as everybody else is doing and mm -hmm. uh the server components kind of reunifies that a little bit and stops that sort of charade that you're building this pure api and a pure agent when really mm -hmm. what you're doing is kind of building an integrated experience and hopefully over time as these platforms develop and maybe you'll agree that'll give us those user experience or more mm -hmm. developer experience gains that 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 make these apps a lot less complicated to build yeah definitely and i'm very excited to see potentially how a server first technology like server components and uh, a local first approach can maybe merge together and because i think most applications uh have data that should live should should live with the user and should live on the server so there's always two categories of data i think in a lot of applications. Like I was recently uh, trying to work on a social media app or like it's it already exists, but I was trying to see how we can convert it to app router. And uh, like, obviously some something like local first doesn't make a lot of sense because you're, you're browsing posts, they're always on sure. the server. Um, but for things like user settings, user preferences, user profile, there's a lot of things in there that we don't need to put on the server that, that can, that need, that can live on the client and just, uh, uh, back up to the server. Well, I I look forward to this. I can't. Yes, that's the continual. I mean, people like to say it's a pendulum, but I, that's the continual mm -hmm. evolution that we'll see is yes. uh, ways to to combine those patterns. And like I said, it's mm -hmm. it's an 
it's an exciting time to be a developer, a web developer. It can be a little disconcerting, I find, this idea that, um, well, it sucks that these things are called meta frameworks, but this idea that there is a meta, the idea mm -hmm. that for so many years there, we knew the correct way to build, the correct mm -hmm. way to build things, and it was a single page application mm -hmm. using these core web technologies. And I feel like that's dissolved now, and sort of mm -hmm. the community has sort of rejected that as the obvious default way. and. Mm -hmm. It's scary a little bit right now that there are so many right ways to build something when a lot mm -hmm. of people, right? The number one question you get, especially if you talk to new developers, is just, what should I learn? What's the mm -hmm. right thing? What's the right way? What should, what's the first thing I should learn? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, going back to the very first thing we said, that's the greatest source of hot takes right now is, you know, trying to reestablish the new meta. What mm -hmm. is the new correct way to do things? And I like that the community maybe largely, whether they want to or don't want to, is being forced to sit in this discomfort for a little while, experiment, mm -hmm. play, and ultimately learn that, you know, sometimes you can pick what's the best for your job, you know, for your for your app, for your company, for your team, for yourself. Yeah. And if you're if you're in a state where you're trying to figure out what would be what's the best way to build, just pick one and start building. Like actually building is a much better way to figure out if something works or not than just thinking about it or talking about it. And I think it's like, that's what, like some of these things, these, uh, you know, stacks that have developed mm -hmm. where it's, you know, a popular uh, creator or a, a community has developed around a certain way of doing things. Mm -hmm. and sometimes people look down on it, but then it builds steam. So who knows, yeah. even just going out and experimenting and doing things your own way, you might find a lot of like-minded people out there. And suddenly mm -hmm. now you're maintaining your own new, new <laughs> approach. And then we'll be talking to you on the podcast soon. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, as we wrap up here, uh, Deb, can you tell people where they can find you online if they want to hear more or connect with you? Sure. Yes. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I make YouTube videos sometimes about software development and architecture. I'm hoping to make one soon about how Vercel moved back from Edge. I don't know. Uh, no promises, though. Uh, follow me on Twitter. My full name, Dev Agarwal 9 I'm sure there'll be a link somewhere. And... Uh, I think that's pretty much it. LinkedIn, if you care about it, sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, don't don't knock it. LinkedIn's kind of on a resurgence. Uh, so fair. Uh, I, I did I did go. find this job on LinkedIn though, so I gotta respect. <laughs> there you go. All the more reason. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's gonna be it for us today. Thank you everybody for listening to this modern web podcast, and thank you to our guest Dev. As always, the conversation does not stop here. As you just heard, you can find Dev on Twitter at devagarwal09. That's D E V. A G R A W A L 09. You can find me online at RoboCell. As for the podcast, you can find us online at moderndotweb.com or on Twitter at modern.web. See you all next time, everybody. Sometimes it's hard to bridge the gap between business objectives and tech implementation, and it can get messy. This dot is trusted by top names like Meta, Google, and T Mobile, and they love helping business leaders fulfill their strategic digital initiatives. Check them out at thisdot.co. One more time, that's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O.